Now we have the keynote, uh, the closing keynote. Uh, Martin, all over to you. Right, well, I'm really happy to see quite a few people stayed right to the end. Um, it's really an honor to be asked to be the, the closing keynote speaker when representing. Uh, I was going to say, you know, it's something completely different, but uh, I can't really say that now. We had two, two solutions in the Jugal Bandi. Uh, Anyway, I'm definitely coming back next year. This is becoming one of my favorite times of the year, coming to India in September. Will it be in September? Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about some features we've just added to Dialog APL about a year ago. And, and give you, I mean, they're not very dissimilar to, you know, f uh, features that are in other languages like like closure, but the, the difference in flavor is probably that we have arrays of these things because when, as APL programmers, you know, we see everything as, as arrays. I'm going to very quickly, I may not need to do this now that both I and Jay showed you some APL a few minutes ago, but I think I'll spend a few minutes just showing you APL. How many people were at my talk last year and sort of remember how APL works? No, not that many. So I'll spend just a, just a few minutes on that. And then, despite the fact that we have all these parallel array-oriented language features in APL, it turns out they don't really allow us to achieve this goal of putting parallel hardware at the fingertips of all these uh, domain expert users that we have using APL. And then explain a little bit about how we arrived at the proposed solution and talk about what we're doing. So, very brief APL refresher. I think this is one of my slides from, from last year. So the syntax of APL is really very, very simple there. It's only, you know, as you, you can't even fill a, a complete page with the different forms. Either you have an array, which is typically created by juxtaposing items of data with spaces in between them, or you have a function followed by one argument. This is the index generator, so iota 6 returns the numbers from 1 to 6. In, um, or you have a function with a left argument and a right argument, and the map is typically implicit. In, in most of these functions, not all of them, map is implicit. So this is adding item-wise on the left and right. Then we have things that we call operators that uh, you would normally refer to as higher-order functions. So this slash here is, a, is an operator, we call it, which takes this function multiplication as the left operand and produces times reduction in this case. So this is the product of all those elements. Um, then with the, the reduction with a number on the left gives you a sliding window. So this is the sum with the window size of two reduction going through the array. And all of these extend to higher rank arrays as well. It's not just vectors. Then we have things like the inner product. So this is the vector product where you're multiplying, element, you're mapping the multiplication and then doing a plus reduction at the end. So that's the regular vector product um, from mathematics. And then finally indexing. And one thing which is a bit different again about APL is you can index with an array and you get a result back which is the same shape as, uh, as the index array. So let's just very briefly um, play a little bit with this. So here's my interactive APL session. Um, is the font, uh, font size about, about right? I'll try and bring it up. See if I can get away with that. So if you're trying, learning APL, we have the language bar with all this. We use these symbols, right? And you, you can basically see all of them up here now. So students of APL tend to just hover along this thing and get the definition of each one of these functions and win programming competitions doing that. So here's a matrix, the three by four reshape of IOTA 12 this is as close as you'll get to a type declaration in APL. I want a two dimensional array of integers here. Um, and then the map is usually implicit, but if you, if you want better control, I mean you have each left and each right in some languages. This is an operator called rank, so we're multiplying and we're saying we want a left rank of one and a right rank of zero. So take vectors from the left and scalars from the right. So it's multiplying each element on the right with an entire row on the left. So we can control exactly how we split the arrays up and match the items when we do the map. Uh, we have the outer product, so combining all the elements 
Um, so every item here has been paired with every other item there using this function. So that gives you the little multiplication table when you use the numbers from 1 to 10. Here's the vector product that we saw before, but in APL, um, it, this is a general construct. So this is not just vector product. This is the specific case of plus dot times. You could also do a plus dot not equals. So if I make a two by five array with these characters, Italy and Benin, and say how many are different from India, I get four for each because there's only one letter that matches in each of the rows. Um, so we have these general generalizations rather than specific matrix multiplication, vector multiplication, and so on. Reduction we talked about. And of course, the definition of the vector product could also be written like this. It's the map of multiplication and then the plus reduction. Something we've added very recently, which is also inherently a very parallel operator, is an operator called key, which takes a function on the left and keys and values, and it then, for each unique key, it calls this function with the key as the left argument, alpha, and all the data items corresponding to that key as the right argument. So if we have a function here that says, give me the key and the sum of the data items, we've summed, this is a group by select sum right argument, uh, group by left argument. And I don't know that we can quite run this as fast as uh, Julia, but here's a, this is a dynamic interpreted language. I'm generating 100 million random numbers and doing the frequency count by you saying, just count the unique items for each distinct key. So when I don't provide a left argument with the keys, it uses the right argument uh, and the indices passes the indices as the data. So we have all these forms. And yet, um, oh yeah, if you want to see more of the talk that I did here last year, I got some really good feedback from Ryan Lemmer, who was here. And that helped me turn it into what became a, a talk which is, was recorded by Google about uh, two months ago. So if you want to see uh, an improved version of that, thanks to Ryan, go to the YouTube Google Talks channel and uh, look for that talk. And that's about an hour and then half an hour of grilling by Google engineers uh, at the end of it. So we have all these things, you know, where we can, you know, the user only has to write a few symbols and then the interpreter just does all this looping through to, to produce lots of stuff in parallel. We have the implicit map, we have implicit, explicit, if you have a user-defined function, something which doesn't just implicitly map, you can ask for things to be mapped. And of course, reductions and scans can be broken down and parallelized as well. So you would think, you know, we're, we're pretty much there. We also have asynchronous language features. So we've had these for about 20 years that the user can launch a function in a separate thread and then wait for the result. And you can have critical sections and latches and semaphores and so on. But we still had to do something last year, you know. We can't just rest on our laurels. And why is that? Well, the existing time slicing with the threading function is actually, we're actually cheating. We only have one OS thread like some of, some of the older languages. Um, we have an interpreter core that's 30 years old and we can't really reasonably refactor it to be thread safe in a short amount of time with a, an acceptable bug curve. But also when you think about it, um, and you read books by experts on concurrency, it seems, it seems quite clear that you know, if, if programming with threads and locks is so hard for real software engineers, our domain experts, our actuaries, and our petroleum engineers and chemical engineers who are using the product won't stand a chance with those things. Now, of course, we can thread all that implicit stuff. And, and we have done work on that, so um, I think I'm going to have to bring the... So if you're working with large arrays, you can do things. You can ask the computer, well, how many threads have I got? Please use four of them in parallel when there are large array operations. You can set a threshold at which, if you're doing large floating point array operations, the APL interpreter will just automatically go into that. 
We don't do that automatically because you might be running on a server where you're competing with, with other users for resources and you don't want to just automatically go off and multi-thread stuff. If the machine's already running at 100% CPU utilization, there's no point to do that. But so just to show the performance that you can get if you have a dedicated workstation. So here are two arrays that are, one of them is at this above the threshold and one of them I've done a negative one drop and drop the last item off. So these two vectors called single are just so short that if we do, if we benchmark them, they'll run single threaded whereas the other ones will run multi-threaded. So um, for plus, adding two vectors together, we actually get a slight slowdown. And that's because the chip can add numbers up so fast that you just get a memory bottleneck and contention and things don't speed up at all. I think you'll get this kind of result in just about any typical uh, multi-core machine today. Things get a bit better uh, if we do division. There's a bit more work for the CPUs to do between each piece of data that arrives. Actually, we got about a third. And then if you go off and do something like take the A logarithm of B, which is really hard work, um, you might get you know, a little bit more than double the speed on this kind of machine. So it turns out that although you can get those speed ups, actually few applications where there's a significant quantity of this kind of data parallelism going on. There'll be some of it. For some applications, they can get a significant speed up from that. Um, you know, there's fluid dynamics, image manipulations, and so on, where these effects uh, work. But for most of our users who are doing things like asset management and risk calculations, they'll only have a few sections of their code where they can benefit from that. So parallelizing SIMD primitives that are executed sequentially doesn't help much. We are funding work at a university to have a compiler written for APL, and, and Jay, is, uh, who was also up here, is working on um, doing data flow analysis and trying to do compiling in the interpreter. But idiomatic APL is shape type and rank invariant. So it's really hard for a compiler to understand how to do this. We could add optional uh, type declarations. We'll probably do that. But we need something more uh, in the short term to really help people uh, use the cores that they now have available to them. We actually need to ask the user to help, to give us some hints. Because um, the user knows how big the arrays are, where they parallel threads or cores are available. So we needed to come up with some new language features that would make it easy for the user to express optionally asynchronous sections of algorithms without using uh, you know, the traditional locks, semaphores, and so on. So it turns out that there is actually one more parallel form that Dialog APL has that the other APL interpreters uh, don't have. And that's because about 20 years ago, we started working with objects. And we have a thing that uh, we call a namespace. I think in, in traditional jargon, it would be a dynamic object. So it's just, I just created a space uh, with a built-in function, quad and s. And into that, I can insert anything that I want. So it's a dynamic container. I can insert any function, any code variables into it as I wish. And I can refer to it, of course. Uh, and I can execute expressions inside of it. So I can't, I don't just have, uh, I can't just refer to its properties, but if I put a parenthesis after the dot, I can execute any APL language expression in the context of this uh, space. And I could create another one. And let's put a slightly smaller matrix into that one, just a, a two by three. And now I can catenate these two spaces together and call it NSS. So NSS is now an array of two namespaces. Um, and we decided that w um, arrays are not objects in APL. Arrays are more important to us than objects. So when you put the dot after an array of objects, that's a reference to each of the objects inside the array. 
So this is now executing that expression inside both of those, right? So we have the matrix catenated the sum of each row. So this expression to catenate the sum of each row to the matrix has been executed inside each one of these spaces. So in APL, if you have an array of, in Dialog APL specifically, if you have an array of objects dot expression, that's an implicit map operation. I don't know if there are other, there may be one or two other languages that do something like that. Does anybody know of a language that uses that syntax? The only one I'm aware of is uh, SQL. Because in SQL, if you, if you say something like this, it's a reference to the collection of rows that are in the table. So it's actually executing that expression, if you like, on each, each object in the table. Um, yeah, the comments are unfortunately appearing off the size side, but I think it's better to, to keep a high font size. So what we thought was, what if we came up with a function that we call isolate? which if you apply it to a namespace, it creates an isolated namespace, which is, to all intents and purposes, it's right here, I can still do the same kind of thing in it, but when the, ex when the expressions are executed, it's happening asynchronously. So they are actually isolated from the main body of, of the interpreter. They actually run, in the current model, they actually run in a separate process that's been started for that, for that purpose. Now, if all you could do was to, you know, block and wait for all of those to, all of those results to be computed in parallel, that would still be interesting. But the, this is actually a two-step process. The, the result of each one of those expressions is immediately returned as a future, no matter how long the, the uh, expression takes to execute. So we immediately get an array of two futures back. Um, but because I decided to display them in the session, the system had to block on the futures until they were materialized and then display them in the session. And the same thing here. I have my array of two isolates. I call the delay function in APL. This is a built-in function called quad DL. So I called it with an argument of four on the first isolate and six on the second isolate. I'll do that again. So we have to wait for six seconds since we displayed them both. We have to wait until they've all materialized and then we get the result back. But if I were to assign them to a, an array, I can immediately say, well, how many are there? And if I ask for the first one, I immediately, well, I talked too much, so five seconds had passed and I immediately saw the result. Uh, I'll just do that again. So I wait, I ask how many there are. I ask for the first one, I have to wait until five seconds have passed. And if I ask to see the whole array, I now have to wait until the whole thing is materialized. So I can decide whether I want to wait on them individually, or there are also functions you can call to ask which ones are ready if you're a service that can't afford to block and so on. Um, but this is, this is sort of the key to the whole idea that you get these arrays uh, of futures back. So just to, to recap what was happening there, we have our main workspace, as we call it in APL, where all our data is uh, the working storage. If I execute this expression to say I want three isolates, in this case not passing namespaces, but just an three empty arrays as arguments, it sort of creates this illusion that my workspace has been extended with these namespaces. And I can do things like say, well, put X, assign to X a three element vector that does a distributed assignment because there are three objects on the left and a three element array on the right. It assigns X to these three different values. And then when I execute a statement like, well, compute the average of X inside each namespace, those expressions run in parallel. So just to give us an example to, to play with, here's a mathematical definition. Two numbers are co-prime if they have no common factors. In APL, you can write that because the or, Boolean or function has been extended to um, uh, more complex types as the greatest common denominator. If I can say if one is equal to the greatest common denominator of my two arguments, 
They are therefore co-prime. And of course, creating explicit isolates, as we saw before, is all very well. But if all you want to do is just you know, execute a function like that a lot, uh, that's expensive on a large array of arguments, you don't really want to go through the process of creating all those isolates. So we propose a new operator called parallel, which if you say function parallel, that will automatically create an isolate containing just that one function, execute it and return a future, and then discard the isolate. So say we wanted to count all the co-primes smaller than n for n equals 1 to 10. In APL, we could say uh, 1 equals omega GCD, all of the numbers up to omega. So that's, uh, if they're equal to 1, then those numbers up to omega are co-prime. Um, and apply that with the each operator to the numbers from 1 to 10. And that would give us a vector like this. We can, in, now that um, we have the parallel operator, the user can say, well, I happen to know this thing is, it has no side effects, you can safely run it in parallel, and just insert the parallel operator there to give the interpreter the hint that these things are safely uh, parallelizable. We get the same result, of course, which is one of the really important things. And of course, futures, we saw that we could, um, we could ask for the shape of an array containing futures. The interpreter, the primitives don't block until they actually need a value. We can also pass arrays containing futures around as arguments to other functions, and the blocking doesn't happen until somebody actually needs the, the numeric value of something, for example. Um, so we could do something like we could say we want to do this comp computation we saw before on the numbers 1 to 100, immediately get an array of 100 futures back, ask how many are there, 100. We could partition it, so I'm creating a 100 element vector here with a 1 every 25 elements, and then using that as a, mar uh, as a mask to splice up my data into four pieces of 25 each, because I have an idea that these things will materialize at different times. Uh, I can see I have, so none of this is blocked yet because I haven't asked any questions that require the actual value of it. But then I say, well, I'd like to compute the average of each one of those 25 numbers and I'll launch that computation in parallel threads as well. So that'll then start four parallel threads, each one of which will wait for its 25 inputs to materialize before it runs. So by inserting those two parallels there, we have been using, say, 105 threads to do this computation under the user's control. And just to show that actually running, here's uh, our, our task is to fill up the fish tank. And I just installed Windows 10 on this machine and I found to my utter dismay just before you know, coming here to do this presentation that even when I'm running all four cores, it only says about 30%, which I don't understand. Um, so here's our, here's our co-prime ratio. So we're not just going to uh, count how many co-primes there are less than the right argument, but we're going to express that as a fraction of the number itself. So how, how large a percentage or fraction of the numbers less than omega um, are co-prime? So for one, it's all of them. For two, it's half of them, and so on, up to 10. So we're generating a floating point number here for each number. And here's a little function. I want to get the minimum, so the the min reduction catenated with the max reduction, this is something we call a fork. So you have two functions that are both applied to the right argument and then a joining function, which could be anything, but in this case is, is catenate. So if I ask for the min max of co-prime ratio, I'm getting the, the smallest and the largest. Now this is all very fast for small numbers, but of course as the numbers get bigger, this, this all slows down. So. That's still very fast, 10,000, you still can't really tell, 100,000, it's a bit of a delay there, 
Um, so let's do 200 numbers in the uh, in the 100,000 ratio, and we'll see that I don't know how many 100 million GCD computations we're doing. But by default, of course, although we do that with each, you see only one of the cores uh, was in use. This is an I, I7, so I guess it, it really has two, two cores that are, that are multi-threading. And in current APL, we haven't actually implemented that uh, parallel primitive as, as I displayed it on the slide. But parallel each has been given this name. You see, it looks a little bit like a parallel in each. So this is a valid name for a user-defined uh, operator in APL. So we've defined one which gives the same effect for the user while the users are playing with this so they can give us some feedback on whether this is really a, we've come up with a, a good language design. And you see that runs, it did, I mean, this was using all the cores on the machine, right? But it still only gave a peak of, at about a third. But you see, it ran in, in a bit under half the time, which is sort of par for, um, for this kind of, of laptop. You can't go much higher than that because you're getting memory contention between the, between the CPUs. We're using quite a large amount of memory here generating those arrays. And of course, the good news is that the, the results are identical. They are the AND reduction of the element-wise equals is one. Okay. So the thing that's, that's really important to us about this design is that it gives us deterministic parallelism. So if we have, this is the shortened version of the code that we had up on the slide before. We're creating 100. Um, partial results, dividing them up into quarters, computing the average of each one, and getting this number here. The really important thing to us is that we can insert or remove these without it changing the meaning of the expression. And since APL is very often used as almost, you know, specification language, a mathematical description of the problem to be solved, rather than just as a traditional programming language, we think this is really important to our users. You can sprinkle these things in your code where you think there is parallelism. You can measure the performance, find out whether it's a good idea, complain to us that we're not scheduling things well or, or whatever. Uh, but you can continue to use APL as a notation, as long as your functions actually have no side effects. Of course, if these things are doing Oracle database insertions in there, uh, which is not something that we can easily always detect. They may be doing it in a very indirect fashion by communicating with some web service. Uh, we can't see what's going on out there. So it's up to the user to make the statement that this is safe. And of course, if you don't have errors, because if you execute a function that returns a future and you never refer to the result, you might actually have errors occurring in your code and never detect it, because the future is returned immediately when the tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, it might actually change the behavior of your code if it needs to, to trap errors. So in the, it's, it's a model implementation at the moment. That is, the futures are fully implemented in the interpreter because it needs to decide when to block on something. But all the machinery for manufacturing the isolates and, and launching uh, function calls in them is still written in APL actually launches new processes, connects with TCP. Uh, so in the future, we imagine we might you know, very much optimize how that's done, uh, not create completely separate processes, and use other communication forms than TCP. But of course, the TCP allows us to run uh, servers, isolate servers on other machines. So you can, you can create a farm very easily with these things. The full model Im implementation has more of these combinations, uh, so the, the parallel forms that we looked at earlier. So uh, for example, you can do a parallel key, parallel rank, and a parallel outer product using uh, creatively selected names. If you don't like those, they have very traditional names as well that you can use. I know some of our, my American friends are rather annoyed at me for picking these names which I can all type on my Danish keyboard without, without any problems. But I feel, I feel I'm just getting 
you know, getting my own back for 30 years of having to live with dollar signs and things that weren't on my keyboard. Um, if you want to read more about this, it's all, you know, it's a model, but it's fully documented on our website, and there are videos uh, demonstrating their use much more extensively, or um, how to use all the infrastructure management functions to decide how many processes to start, whether to start them on other machines, and so on. So apart from the obvious things, like once we get the feedback from the users, which so far is pretty good in terms of the design, um, implementing this much more efficiently, and then sort of all the obvious things, like giving, giving users knobs to, to twiddle on to, to optimize the, the use of processes, fault tolerance, queue, batch management, and so on, because um, as soon as you start using this, you actually want to, to be able to schedule things and declare dependencies and so on. But we also want to make sure for the casual user who just needs to insert that one or two, one or two parallels in their code to speed things up in a small application, that's all there already. We have ideas for you know, promises, uh, so where you create a future explicitly rather than just having it created implicitly by calling, uh, making a call in an isolate. It sort of it immediately leads to, although APL is a very eager language uh, at heart, we could have an operator where you can give a function as an operand to an operator. The Schrodinger operator is the internal name for this now, because you, know, you could have a function that tells you whether the cat is alive or dead. Pass it as a left operand to this function, and then it wouldn't evaluate it until you actually ask. You could have an array of 10 cats, which were futures, but the, the fate of the cat would not be determined until you reference the ith item of, of the array. Um, and the work that's been done at Indiana University by uh, Aaron Zhu, who we are um, cooperating with here, he contributed to the design of this because he's planning to use this in a compiler where he'll be able to do data flow analysis at a very finely grained level. Um, so that gives a whole, if he's successful with that, it gives a whole bunch of new opportunities. So far in the, the typical results with this current naive model achieved by domain experts, uh, mostly refactoring their own code, sometimes with a consultant to help them for a day to get started, is sort of what you would expect. I mean, most machines are doing hyper-threading. They don't really have the number of cores that they claim to have when the pedal hits the metal. But these numbers are definitely worth having for people who are doing writing actuarial applications and so on. Uh, your mileage will vary a lot depending on whether you're doing enough number crunching compared to your memory consumption. And we're waiting for the compiler. They're also quite fun. Um, you can do crazy things like sit on a Mac and create Windows UI on a remote computer with this. Um, there are functions to, I'm going to show you a video in a second, which shows what happened when you start, a, you have two Raspberry Pi controlled robots. You start an isolate server on each one. And now you can just have bot one and bot two as objects in your, in your workspace. You know, add, add the servers, they have these IP addresses, 100, 101. Clone your bot control namespace so that your code gets copied out onto the onto the Raspberry Pi. And then you could write an expression like this. So bots is now a two element vector of objects corresponding to the two robots. And you can say for 500 milliseconds for both of them, drive one of them with this power on the right and left wheels and the other one like that, which gives you this kind of effect. You can see the arguments. Well, you can't read the arguments. So you can have dancing robots. Oops. Um, and uh, yeah, well, maybe take that slide. So I've actually managed to leave a little bit of time for questions this time. Um, Last time I was a little bit rushed, I seem to remember. 
Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Or is it just all, all obvious and similar to what you're already using? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so the question is, uh, how could you use this technology if you had functions that you wanted to run functions that actually did have side effects? Um, and, and there's nothing to prevent. I mean, there's no problem with running functions that have side effects. They will just have side effects, and the result, if you're relying on the order in which the functions are executed, then your result will be non-deterministic. Um, you know, they can have errors, they can have side effects. There is also a mechanism that uh, you'll see if you go and look at some of those videos that allow these isolate processes, if you, when they're running a function, to call back into the main process. Uh, for example, if you did have an Oracle database connection, you wouldn't want to create 100 instances of it out there. So you'd want your functional code to be you know, doing its functional stuff. And then when it gets to the point uh, where it needs to make the transaction, it can call back and ask the main process to use the database connection that it already has uh, to do that. Um, yeah, and at the moment, when there are callbacks, we serialize them on the, on the server side. So you can create sort of secure transactions when these little guys out there call back. Process. Yeah. So, error handling. Um, well, if there's an error inside one of these things, by default, it's just trapped and and returned to you. So, if I had, do I still have these guys around? Yeah. So, if I said ISS dot delay four seconds in the first one and negative four seconds in the Second one, um, we do have an engineer, John Scholes, who, who should have been here but uh, had to stay home at the last minute, who says he's working on this. And he hopes before he retires to have implemented negative arguments to the delay function. But I'm, I think he might be joking. But anyway, um, if we do this, we get a four second wait uh, because Actually, it would be better to assign this to a result. Let's do that. Yeah, so we immediately get two futures back. If we ask for the second one, it's, it's failed immediately. Ooh. Ah, okay. This is what happens when you deviate from the script. I was, I, unfortunately, I loaded an older version of the interpreter for the, um, which doesn't properly support this. Uh, it should have signaled that back to me. Let me just uh, give me a second. Uh, load version 14.1. There have been some bug fixes from 14.0 to. Yeah, so isolates is two empty isolates. Delay. Four and negative four. So if I ask for the second one, oh, quad NL. That's the name, the list of names in there. I wanted to delay. It gives me a, it just says when I refer to that item of the array, it's like the, the errors have almost become first class objects in the language. They haven't quite but it, it gives that effect. If I refer to the first one, since four seconds have now passed, I get it. If it had been less than four seconds, I would just have waited on that. Um, you can say, well, I'm developing code. I want to be able to debug it. And it would then run the isolates in a debuggable version of the interpreter so you could connect a debugger to it when they fail and fix them. And that, of course, is, is one of the really interesting challenges going forward is that if you have 100 of these things, uh, that you've launched, you actually want the debugger to come up and say, well, you've got 23 domain errors and four length errors and one workspace full. Which one would you like to look at? 
and you look at one of them and you trace through it and you fix, the, I mean, ed, sort of edit and resume has been the, the norm in APL, I think, since 1966 when the first APL interpreter was. So then you wanted to say, okay, so do you want that code fix redistributed to the other 22 isolates that are all currently suspended at the same place in the code? And say, yes, please. Patches them all up and, and they continue running. So when this stuff really kicks in and starts being used by these, I think I mean, everybody would want that, but certainly the more non-technical users would dem demand that. Um, so this is the beginning of, of many years worth of work. I don't know, um, do, do other languages that have futures have, are there any that have reached that level now in debuggers where they will patch on the fly multiple instances simultaneously? Yep. So there's, I mean, I think that the comment that was made yesterday about us in the fishbowl, about us not having reached the industrial revolution is very, very accurate for a lot of software. If you consider the automobile after about 50 years, so it was invented in 19, well, 18, late 1800s, 50 years later, the cars that you had then, I think are, you know, a good mental image of where we still are with, uh, with software. There's a long way to go with this stuff. Um, but I think function, you know, writing code in a functional style is, is clearly the way forward. I think all, all other, there is no alternative. As, as everything becomes more parallel, we must go that way because no, nothing else can work. But fortunately, you know, there's lots of good languages popping up where you can do that. And uh, APL, of course, originally had, you know, a, well, it still allows you uh, to write in a very imperative style. Um, and every user meeting I have, including the one I was just at last week, I tell my users, you know, you've got to move away from the imperative style and the object style and use the functional, the curly bracket style of writing functions because otherwise in five years time, you, you're going to be in big trouble. You may still be okay, but your competitors are going to be running rings around you in five to 10 years if you don't solve this now. And as a vendor, of course, we have to, as, a lang as language designers, we have to provide the tools to make that easy for them. Yep. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to being back next year to see what's new. I thought the Julia, uh, Julia presentation looked awesome. I'm going to have to have a look at that. There must be some ideas worth stealing there. <laughs> yep, okay, so uh, that's it, I think. Thank you very much. All right, that was uh, a fantastic way to close the conference, so thanks, Martin, for that.